بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على موث رحمة العالمين النبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد اليوم كم من الشهر اليوم سبعة من شهر صفر ألف وأربعمائة واثنان وأربعون الموافق ل أربعة وعشرين من شهر سبتمبر ألفين وعشرين نواصل درسنا بإذن الله تعالى في هذا الكتاب المبارك الداء والدواء uh, Last week was the first uh, session and today بإذن الله تعالى we we'll move on to the next uh, uh, session إن شاء الله uh, which uh, is the continuation of what we have begun before uh, If you can remember last uh, class uh, we talk about an introduction you know, about the muallif the author himself who was uh, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, and also the reason why he is compiling this uh, book, the cause of uh, the book's uh, compilation, and also uh, the introduction, which is uh, very brief by the Mu'allif, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, and we reach a place where Ibn al-Qayyim told us that there was no disease that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had tested human being with, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down along with it the cure for that, for that disease. So every disease that comes, comes with a cure. So there is no such thing, a disease without cure, except one uh, disease the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called Al-Haram. Al-Haram means the old age. Old age, you can't do anything. When your time already finished, you cannot wind it back and uh, make you fresh or a new life and make yourself younger. Uh, that's not within our capability. So there is no medicine for that. There is no medicine for that. The only medicine for, for this possibly is righteousness, a person to be extremely good. And uh, also uh, when he reach back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will turn his life into that which he's looking for. Uh, because when you go to paradise, you don't remain in the way you are. You, know, you don't even reach 40. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you at the age of 33, 30 years old. And you remain like that forever. So that's the best uh, type of ages. So uh, you don't need to uh, uh, go into these uh, processes whereby a person uh, who reached the old age but he's not happy with that, he wants to come back to the new life. It doesn't work. You know, Sharia told us that this one cannot be cured at all. So other than that, there is no disease which, which doesn't have a cure. So we have heard a lot from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, And this is what this book is going to be uh, dealing with. You have the diseases that are dealing with the knowledge and the diseases that are dealing with the qasd and which are addressed by Allah SWT in Surah Al-Fatiha. And uh, all of these diseases that are affecting the heart in a very bad way. So we will be talking about these diseases, inshallah, from... Uh, the beginning of the book until the end of it. And I guess this is what we should be understanding concerning the subject matter of the book. So, uh, Sheikh said, وَقَدْ جَعْلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْجَهْلَ دَاءً The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has made ignorance a sick, a sickness. You know, The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم considered ignorance as a sickness and a disease. You know, So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made ignorance a disease. And the Prophet ﷺ made the remedy, you know, and the remedy for the, the sickness that is uh, based on ignorance is to ask the scholars, you know, the people of knowledge. So ignorance is a disease. What is the remedy for this ignorance? To ask the scholars, you know, to approach the scholars and ask them about whatsoever you need. And this is very necessary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسَأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ You have a group of people who went astray because of this uh, fact. A group of people who went astray because of, because of uh, this fact. Uh, no problem, inshallah. So uh, these people, they are the, the Nasara. You know. Nasara, these are the Christians. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of ignorance. They went astray. And you do have also some people amongst the Muslims who are worshipping Allah SWT out of ignorance, they are also going astray. That's why in Surah Al-Fatiha, always you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you knowledge, you know, so that it will not be like the Christians who are ignorant, 
when it comes to approaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you ability to put that which you learned into practice and action so that you will not be like the Jew because the Jew they have the truth and they know the truth but they hate it and they refuse to follow it that's why they deserve to receive the anger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you not to be ignorant and also once you, once you learn something you have to put it into practice and action so that's the statement from uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indirectly that we always read at least 17 times in a day, you know, on the daily basis in Surah Al-Fatiha. So let's see what Sheikh has to prove this fact that ignorance is the disease. And the remedy, the medicine for ignorance is asking the scholars. قَالَ فَرَوَى أَبُوْ دَاوُدَ فِي سُنَنِهِ من حديث جابر بن عبد الله قال خرجنا في سفر فأصاب رجلا منا حجر فشجه في رأسه ثم احتلم فسأل أصحابه فقال هل تجدون لي رخصة في التيمم قالوا ما نجد لك رخصة وأنت تقدر على الماء فاغتسل, فاغتسل فمات فلما قدمنا على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أخبر بذلك فقال قاتلوه قتلهم الله ألا سألوا إذ جهلوا إنما شفاء العي السؤال إنما كان يكفيه أن يتيمم ويعصر أو يعصب على جرحه خرقة ثم يمسح عليها ويكسر سائر جسده. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in this hadith Jabir said Jabir رضي الله عنه ابن عبد الله he said we went out in one of the journeys you know uh, we are on a journey one day a group of companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم are on a journey. فَأَصَابَ رَجُلًا مِنَّا حَجْرٌ So a stone came and hit one of the companions who was with them. So it injured his, his head. It caused him an injury on, on the head. Big injury on the head. So unfortunately, he slept at night. At night when he woke up, he woke up in a wet dream. You know, he saw something that necessitated ghusl for the janaba. So now, you know, in ghusl you have to wash all of your body. Every single part of the body has to be addressed by by the water. So the man told the companions, uh, He said, do you find any, do I have any excuse, you know, to make tayammum instead of uh, washing myself completely? Do I have any, any excuse to make tayammum? You know, instead of go, going for the ghusl, do I have any excuse to make tayammum? They say, we don't find any excuse for you. You don't have excuse. What does that mean? You have to go and wash yourself and completely like a normal person. You know? So this is the problem. You know, They told him, you have to go and wash yourself like anybody else. You don't have any excuse. You know, They are unaware of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لم يجعل علينا في الدين من حرج. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never placed difficulty in this religion. And this sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came actually to remove difficulty in the life of humankind. Very beautiful legal maxims. Wherever difficulty exists in the life of human beings, then ease will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot sit down and pray. You cannot stand up and pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you to sit down. You cannot fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you to delay the fast until the time you are able to do it. If you are sick, for instance. You know, there are a lot of things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really lenient you know, upon us whenever we cannot do so these companions, they miss these legal maxims and principles. So they believe with the azima that we have to go with that. So when they ask, when they were asked, do we have, you know, does that person has any, any concession? You know, is there any excuse for him to go for the tayammum instead of making kusul? قَالُوا لَا مَا نَجُدْ لَكَ رُخْصَةً So they told him, we don't find any rukhsa for you. You, know, you have to take shower, you have to wash yourself. قال ف وأنت تقدر على الماء. So they told him as long as you can use water, you have to use it, because there is a water there. Okay, the water is there. They said, why can you take? Uh, how can you make tayammum after having the water with you? Because Allah subhanahu wa taala says, فلم تجد ما أن فتيمم. When you don't find the water, then you go for the tayammum. They told him, you can you can find the water. How can you go for the tayammum? So he was consulting them. So when they advised him to go for the ghusl, he did accept their advice. 
And subhanAllah, when he washed himself, he puts the water on that injury, you know, and the pain increased. He couldn't bear it and it was the cause of his life. He died because of it. So when he died because of it, فَلَمَّا قَدِمْنَا عَلَى النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم When they reached back to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, أَخْبَرُوا They told the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم what happened. You know. They told the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم what happened. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, قَتَلُوهُ قَتَلَهُمْ الله. They killed him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kill them also. SubhanAllah. It's a very heavy word. But the one who is given fatwa in the wrong way, you know, deserve this kind of words, you know. They shouldn't. They should refer him to somebody who knows. Or let's delay his situation until he reached the Prophet Sallallahu But that was the mistake. So that we should, we, we understand that giving fatwa without knowledge is very dangerous. Wallahi, he's very dangerous. Even some sees it to be one of the most dangerous sins that somebody they took, I mean, to disobey Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It's very dangerous to give fatwa without knowledge. It can cause the life of the mufti and it can cause the life of the mufta. له. You know, the one that you give in fatwa might lose his life. As in this case, you know, in this case, this person lost his life because of what? Because of the wrong fatwa given to him. You know, how many people lost their, their life, lost their money, lost their honor and dignity? You know, in some places we are told that the, the decency of the brothers and the sisters was taken completely because of the fatwa given by one of the scholars, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide him on us. You know. It's a very sensitive matter, and the Mufti should understand this, you know, that the whole community is focusing on you. Whatever wrong fatwa you're giving them, if they put it into practice and action, it comes back to you also. So it destroys the community, it can destroy the life of individuals, you know, as this one lost his life because of this wrong, wrong fatwa. And you know, as I said also, it can cost the person to lose his life himself. You all remember the person who killed 99 people, you know. At the end of the day, he decided to repent, you know. When he was given a fatwa by a wrong person, you know, somebody who is not qualified to give fatwa, but he gave the fatwa. What happened after that? SubhanAllah, when he realized that this fatwa is indicating that he cannot be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore, that means hell forever, you know. There is no way for him to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what did he say? If there is no point of making repentance, because even if I repent, I will still go to hell. Why should I repent then? So he completed number 100 by that person who gave him the fatwa. So subhanAllah, wrong fatwa caused that sheikh or, or whoever you call it, avid, monk, you know, to lose his life. So it's very dangerous, brothers and sisters. We have to really be very careful. And it's a very strong position that you are putting yourself, which you should get ready to receive heavy questions in the hereafter when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because once you open your mouth to tell somebody uh, that this is Sharia, you're talking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, some people, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told some of the companions, you know, out of the fear of them not being able to reach, you know, and to make it in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, he told them if you meet uh, your enemy and they ask you to put them in the hukum, to decide, you know, using the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but this, because these are matters of dunya, dunya matters, you know, these are dunya matters, matters of mu'amalat, you know, where there is no specific text from the Quran to address it. You're going to make ijtihad, you know, use your uh, personal effort based on the knowledge you have, you know, to take from the inferences to make sure that you make a right conclusion. This conclusion might be right, this conclusion might be wrong. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, فَلَا تَنَزِّرْهُمْ عَلَى حُكْمِ اللَّهِ Don't say that this is the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell you specifically that this is his hukum. So what must you do? He said, فَنَزِّرْهُمْ عَلَى حُكْمِ كَنْتِ فَنَزِّرْهُمْ عَلَى حُكْمِ Let them, tell them that this is your understanding, this is your ijtihad. If it is wrong, then alhamdulillah, you, you will not be in trouble because you do not attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, I just want us to understand how heavy is this issue, which unfortunately nowadays we are taking it very lightly. Wallahi, unfortunately, nowadays we are taking it very lightly. Everyone is mufti. And nowadays also, it's a lot of entertainment. Dunya is all there. You can see that the companies, they are not willing to move. Why can't they move? Because they have this unqualified scholars just because a person graduates from the university and taking 
the certificate mentioning that he studies Sharia. And we know what is there in the universities, you know. And sometimes some people are losers in the university, don't get anything. You know, after the university, if you to ask him about what he had studied about the Sharia, he forgot everything. But tomorrow, he's going to be a mufti for a company. You know, subhanAllah. And they pump him with money, you know. And he gives fatwa on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not knowing that this is one of the most dangerous situations that a person could be. So what you should do is always to observe the saying of one of the scholars when he says, إِذَا مَا قَتَلْتَ الشَّيْءَ عِلْمًا فَقُلْ بِهِ وَلَا تَقُولِ الشَّيْءَ الَّذِي أَنْتَ جَاهِلُ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَهْوَ أَنْ يُرَى مَتَصَدِّرَ وَيَكْرَهُ لَا أَدْرِ أُصِيبَتْ مَنْ قَتِلُ You want to kill yourself, engage in giving fatwa without knowledge. I mean, even if you don't get the physical harm in this life, in the hereafter, you know, and even in this life, your relationship with Allah SWT will be, will be distorted. So this has a long tale. You know, we cannot cover everything here concerning this matter, but I just want you to have in mind that this is one of the most dangerous situations that a person can put himself in. May Allah SWT grant us good. When you don't know, just tell them I don't know. Imam Malik was asked about 40-something issues. He answered only any and, uh, 10 plus, you know, 13, 17 uh, one, uh, uh, questions, you know, he refused to answer the rest. And the man told him, I came all the way from Morocco to Medina, you know, and you're telling me you don't know. And the people have been waiting for this moment. Everyone is waiting to hear what Imam Malik is going to say, you know. So Imam Malik told him, go to your people and tell them, you ask Imam Malik, and he said, I don't know. SubhanAllah. That's it. Because when you tell people, I know, and you don't know, you are relieving him from his problem by putting yourself into a problem. And you should understand this properly. When you give a fatwa in the wrong way, you know, you are doing a favor for that person to go out of his tragedy. But at the same time, you put yourself into that tragedy. It's like you're buying his tragedy. You know? So we should just be very careful. There is nothing fancy in giving fatwa. And I repeat my word, there is nothing fancy in giving fatwa. Wallahi, there is nothing fancy in giving fatwa. The predecessors, they used to run away from it. Let somebody carry the responsibility. I remember one of the great scholars in, in Medina. Uh, the last advice he gave us in the class when uh, this is at the end of the semester when we finished the classes. He told us, my advice to you is whenever you give fatwa, don't you ever say this is my opinion. Always hanging on the shoulder of others. Let them be responsible on the day of judgment, but you be on the safe side. Narrate the fatwa said by others. Let them be responsible. Don't attribute it to yourself. Say, this is what so and so and so said. This is what the majority of the scholars said. This is what Malikiya said. This is what Shafi'iya said. Hanabila said. This is what Ahnaf said. This is what Zahiriya said. This is what Sufyan uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, this is what Sahabi Fulan Wailan said, you know, but don't say this is what Ibrahim said, Khalid said, Fatima said, Ruba, Karima, Bashira, you know, don't say all of this, you know, just put it, you know, to those people who are your predecessors. That's the best way for you to go out of this uh, tragedy. So, Qala, Qataluhu, Qataluhum Allah, Ala Sa'alu, Id Jahilu, Inna Ma Shifaul Iyi as the Prophet said, why didn't they ask when they do not know? Why didn't they ask when they are ignorant? He says, because the remedy for al-i, al-i here is deficiency. But this deficiency is specific. You know, you have so many types of deficiencies. You know, one of them is al-jahl, ignorance. The Prophet said, the remedy for the ignorance is to ask questions when you don't know. Allah says, فَسَأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ and then the Prophet Sallallahu told him what to do. He says all that what he, 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 he do is, when he is in this situation, then make ta'amu. You know, and also put something on the, on the, on the jur. He has an injury on his head, just cover it. And then when it comes to washing, wash every single part of the body and then wipe that part. You know, put khirqa, khirqa means a fabric, bandage or whatever you can put on the place and then wipe it. You know, make your hand wet and then wipe it a bit, but then put water in it. SubhanAllah, look at the mercy from the Sharia. Look at the mercy from the Sharia. And even, even let's, say, let's say you are in a situation whereby this injury cannot accommodate any attachment, you know. You have to keep it open. And there is no way for you to put water. When you put water, you get into trouble, you might lose your life. You know, in this case, yes, then you move to Taimu. That's it. Islam is very simple. 
Wallahi, if you follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, you relax. But unfortunately, we don't want that. We decided to go into modifications, reinterpretation re of the religion. You know, it's Allah salamu alayhi If you keep the religion in the way it is, you will succeed bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Qala thumma yamsahu alayha wa yagsilu sa'ira jasari. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he just put that, that plastic bandage or whatever and then wipe on it and then wash the rest of his body. فأخبر أن الجهل داء وأن شفاءه السؤال. So from this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that ignorance is a disease. And the remedy and the medicine for ignorance is to ask the scholars. And this is what I said, I guess, last week when I classified people into three categories. Those who are knowledgeable, the scholars and the student of knowledge and the layman in the community. And the layman in society, this one is supposed to always go and ask the scholars. He cannot make ishtihad and do something. If he make ishtihad, even if he is right, you know, even if he's right in that ishtihad, he will get the sin of not asking the scholars because the possibility of him doing it in the wrong way is always there. وَقَدْ أَخْبَرَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى عَنِ الْقُرْآنِ أَنَّهُ شِفَاءٌ فَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَلَوْ جَعَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا أَعْجَمِيًّا لَقَالُوا لَوْلَا فُصِّلَتْ آيَاتُهُ أَعْجَمِيٌّ وَعَرَبِيٌّ قُلْ هُوَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هُدًى وَشِفَاءٌ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرٌ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِمْ عَمًى وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ he says, Ibn al-Qayyim says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that Qur'an is, is shifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that Qur'an is shifa. He says, wa shifa lima fi suduri. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qur'an is a medicine for that which is inside the heart. But is it restricted to the disease that is inside the heart? Or Qur'an could be used to address every type of disease in this life. Is it restricted to address just the disease of the heart, or it is even the physical disease. Because the, the disease of the heart, if you look at it, usually we are talking about, about the shubhat and the shahwat. These are mainly the diseases of the heart. The shubhat and the shahwat. That's why Ibn Qayyim, in one of his uh, approaches, you know, he says that these are the diseases that are based on knowledge and the diseases that are based on al you know, and, and knowledge and the diseases that are based on cost. When you look at the knowledge and uh, you have the ignorance, you know, people not knowing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them to do, you know, they fell into wrong knowledge and wrong interpretation given to them by wrong scholars. And also you have the shibuhat, you know, that it's, it's not easy for a person to, uh, what do you call, it is not easy for a person to uh, stay away from them. You know. So, that does it mean that Quran is is only curing the diseases of the heart, or we can use it, you know, in general? قال وقد جعل الله سبحانه وتعالى القر وقد أخبر الله سبحانه وتعالى عن القرآن أنه شفاء. فقال تعالى ولو جعلناه قرآنا عجميا لقالوا لولا فصلت آياته عجميا وعربي. الله سبحانه وتعالى says if we are to make the Quran عجمي Ajami means to reveal the Quran in a non-Arabic uh, language. You know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used another, another language, not the Arabic language. And to reveal Quran with that. What do you think people would say? You know, because it is directly given to the Arabs and then from there it will be spread to others. You know. So it is not easy those people who are living that kind of life to accept other people. They are very proud of their language. You know, that's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with with something which is stronger than what they what they believe in. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with something which is stronger than what what they are proud of it, and that's the Quran. Because Allah subhanahu wa taala usually sent a prophet, and he sent along with him something that he can use to convince his people that he is coming from from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Musa came with something that looks like magic, but in reality it is not. You know, when you look at it, it looks like what his people is, do, is dealing with. They're dealing magic. So Musa came with something to compete with them, to let them understand that there is somebody who is in control of everything. And subhanAllah, he succeeded, you know. They couldn't do anything. He defeated all of those magicians that came to him to do what? 
to fight him. So Musa was given this. Isa alayhi salam, he came with something that looked like medicine, the real medicine. You know. It does not look like medicine, but the real medicine. Because it goes beyond what they cannot do. You know. He even make a, 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 a clay pigeon, you know, and then uh, blow in it and it flies. You know. what, what, who can do this? You know. They know that nobody can do this. You know. So when Rasulullah came, his people, they are dealing with, with the language. They are proud of having the language. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him, he sent him with the Quran, which is far beyond the reach of any one of them. You know. So that's why you can find even in the history, there are some of those uh, uh, Arabs who are not Muslim at that time, but they prostrated, you know, they make sujood. You know, they make sujood when they listen to the statement from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was reciting the Qur'an. One of them, when he hear the saying of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, فَلَمَّا اسْتَيْأَسُوا مِنْهُ خَلَصُوا نَجِيَا And if you look at the statement and you understand Arabic language, you can understand that this اسْتَيْأَسُوا مِنْهُ and also the choice of word خَلَصُوا نَجِيَا They isolated themselves to go and discuss the matter. Talking about the story of Yusuf, you know that there are a lot of things which are contained in this word. So the way the word is constructed, you know, this, this uh, Badwi, you know, this uh, Bedouin uh, person, when he hears that, he says this cannot be from uh, Muhammad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if we are going to reveal the Quran as Ajami, some other language, not uh, the Quran, the Arabs will never agree with that. Those people who are with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will tell him, how can he just receive Qur'an like this? You know? How can he come with another language to address us in another language? You know? Allah SWT says, وَلَوْ نَزَّلْنَهُ عَلَىٰ بَعْضِ الْأَعْجَمِينَ فَقَرَأَهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يُؤْمِنُونَ Allah SWT says, قُلْ هُوَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هُدًا وَشِفَىٰ It's not about the language. This is the book, a revelation that Allah SWT has given to the people, but unfortunately, the one who get the benefit from it, they are alladina amanu bihi, those who believe in, in the Quran, those who believe in the Quran. That's why he says, huwa lilladina amanu hudan wa shifa. Quran is for the believers, hudan, guidance, and also shifa, and a remedy and a cure. Why the believers are selected here? Why can't we include everyone? Quran, is it only for the believers? No, it's not. Quran is for everyone. But the one who benefits from the Quran is the one who believes in it. Those who do not believe in the Quran, they don't get the benefit you know, of it. So that's why sometimes the focus is made on the one who believes, because the one who believes is the only one who is making the, the what do you call, the use of that guidance given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the Quran shifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is a cure, is a remedy and a medicine. قَالَ وَالنَّزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we reveal also from the Qur'an that which is shifa. That which is shifa. Shifa means cure and medicine. وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And also mercy for, for the good ones, for the believers. قَالَ مِنَ الْقَيِّمْ وَمِنْ هَا هُنَا لِبَيَانِ الْجِنْسِ لَتَّبْعِيدِ فَإِنَّ الْقُرْآنَ كُلُّهُ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ so here when Allah SWT says, نُنَزِّلُ مِنَ Quran, If you're going to go with the tab'id, tab'id means some part of something. If you say this, this is indicating that not every single part of the Quran is shifa. Because Allah SWT says, نُنَزِّلُ مِنَ Quran. You know, so somebody might interpret it as some part of the Quran is shifa, but some part of it is not. So Ibn Qayyim says, no, it is not. Allah SWT is not talking about a part of the Quran to be shifa, and another part is not the shifa. He says, الجنس. And the jins al-Quran. Every single part of the Quran is shifa. Every single part of it. Some part of it use it for this. Some part of it use it for this. There are some part of it use it just to understand the meaning. It gives you the cure. You know. It gives you the, the health. You know. It kills that which is in the heart. The disease of the shubha and the doubt you know, that a person has in his heart. It kills it. And some part of it, it helps a person actually to cure the physical diseases also. He will mention some of this, inshallah. قَالَ فَإِنَّ الْقُرْآنَ كُلَّهُ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He said, Quran, every single part of it is shifa, and every single part of it is also mercy for, 
for the for the mankind. كما قال في الآية المتقدمة, just like what Allah Subhanahu says in the previous ayah, فهو شفاء للقلوب من داء الجهل والشك والريب. Quran is a remedy and a medicine for the heart from the disease of the ignorance and the disease of the doubt and the disease of doubt and every form of shak you know every single doubt that a person is having Quran is the remedy for that قال فلم ينزل الله من السماء شفاء قط اما ولا انفع اعم ولا انفع ولا اعظم ولا انجع في ازاله الداء من القران he said that was no remedy given by Allah Subhanahu wa which Allah Subhanahu wa revealed to humankind you know to the earth which is greater than the Quran there is no there is no remedy that is remedy that is better than Quran Allah never gave us a medicine which is more general you know which includes every disease you know that is greater than the book of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't have a remedy and a medicine that removes the disease completely that is greater than the Quran فقد ثبت في الصحيحين من حديث ابي سعيد قال انطلق نفر من اصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في سفرة سافروها ابو سعيد الخدري said in this authentic narration he says uh, uh, a group of companions of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went on a journey you know حتى نزلوا على حي من احياء العرب فاستضافوه so they were on a journey so on the way back they 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 needed accommodation you know they passed through a village so they asked them for accommodation and the villagers are very stingy you know those people are very stingy they told them please help us with accommodation they said no we will not give you anything uh, uh, so they don't give them accommodation and they refuse to give them food no accommodation no food so that's mean these people they have to go at the, the side of the city and, and stay there until morning and then they leave you know ف فلودق سيد ذلك الحي so the leader of that village was uh, beaten by a scorpion or a snake something got him you know اذا اراد الله شيئا هيئ له اسباب when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something he will make he will prepare the causes for that thing you know they want the accommodation but nobody is wanting to give them they want food and nobody is willing to feed them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has his own way so the leader of that city got problem with the scorpion you know and he was into trouble and there was nobody to tackle that trouble you know in that place nobody is there to help you know so what happened is they remembered that there were people who came to them yesterday why can't we go and approach them and ask them maybe one of them can do something you know fasa'u lahu bi kulli shay'in fa lam yanfa'hu shay'un they try every way nothing seems to work فقال بعضهم لبعض لو اتيتم هؤلاء الرهط الذين نزلوا لعله يكون عند بعضهم شيء so some of them said instead of wasting your time why can't you go to those people who came to us yesterday and ask maybe some of them have something فاتوهم فقالوا يا ايها الرهط ان سيدنا لودقا so they came and they told them what happened that our leader was in trouble because of this وسعينا له بكل شيء لا ينفعه شيء and we try everything but nothing seems to work فهل عندكم من فهل عند احد منكم من شيء so they told them is there any one of you who has some who can do something no. فقال بعضهم نعم one of them said yes yes i can do that in narration this the same abu said in khudri said i can do that والله اني لا ارقي and he told them that yes i can do the the ruqya for you walakin wallahi laqad istadafnaku falam tudayyifuna fama ana biraqin hatta taj'alu li ju'la and he told them i can do the job for you but don't forget yesterday night we were asking you to help us you need to know you don't want to help us we ask you to let us just stay with you until the next morning you don't want to do that and and uh, no food is given by you to us and today you guys want something from us he said i know how to do it but i will never do anything until you give me something you have to pay for this you know subhanallah he said you have to pay for this fa salihuhum ala qati' min al-ghanam so they made an agreement that they should give them a group of sheep you know in some narration 30 sheep a very good deal 
they agree for him to do the ruqya, to give him the medicine, you know, which he believes, inshallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the cure will take place. But then he told them, you have to pay something. So they agreed to give them around 30 sheep. فَانْتَلَقَ يَدْفُلُ عَلَيْهِ وَيَقْرَوْا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Subhanallah. So he kept on spitting on the, on the place where the person uh, got beaten. So he was uh, doing that and reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. He recited. That's why one of the Surah Al-Fatiha, Al-Shafiya, Al-Shifa. You know, because of this hadith. You know. So he kept on reciting Surah Al-Fatiha and spit. Surah Al-Fatiha and spit on the place. And what happened after that? قَالَ فَكَأَنَّمَا نُشِتَ مِنْ إِقَالِ Subhanallah, the man woke up just like he was tightening and now you give him, you release him from the rope. You know, as if there was nothing happening to him, happened to him. فَانْتَلَقَ يَمْشِي وَمَا بِهِ قَلَبَ So he, he started walking as a normal person and there was no issue with him. Subhanallah, very effective for somebody who believes in it. You know, this is what I always say. These uh, issues, they are very effective if you believe in them. If you don't believe in them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. The way you expect me, I will be like that for you. You have good expectation about me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you what you're expecting. You have bad expectation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave you with your bad expectation. That's why a Muslim should always have husnul dhanni billahi azza wa jal. Every time. Have good expectation about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have good thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think good about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever ever happened to you, no matter what, always be positive. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always be positive. This is the only thing that can help you. Being negative with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never benefit you. Because that negativity will never cause Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change what he planned to do. You know? So, so, فَانْتَلَقَ يَمْشِيُ مَا بِهِ قَلَبَ فَأَوْفَوْهُمْ جُعُوا لَهُمْ الَّذِي صَالِحُهُمْ عَلَيْهِ So, Alhamdulillah, they were honest, so they gave them what they promised to give them. They gave them what they promised to give them. فَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ اِقْتَسِمُوا So some of them said, let's divide it, divide it, you know. We got 30 sheep, so let's divide, distribute it amongst us, you know. Everyone should have a portion for that. فَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ اِقْتَسِمُوا فَقَالَ الَّذِي رَقَعَ The one who did the ruqya said, no, la nafal. Hatta naati al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Fanadkur dalik alahu. Fanadkur, fanadkur alahu aladhi kan. So they said we will not do that. We will not distribute the sheep. We will wait first until we go to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and tell him what exactly happened. Qala fanandur ma amuruna. So we just we tell him what happened and then we see what will be the command from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. فَقَدِّمُوا عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ فَذَكَرُوا ذَلِكَ فَذَكَرُوا لَهُ ذَلِكَ فَقَالَ وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ أَنَّهَا رُقْيَا They reached the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم They told him what happened. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Did you read anything apart from this? He said, No. Are you sure you don't say anything? Because in the past, they used to do the ruqya, but they used words from jinn and shayateen. This is the ruqya that is based on shirk. They're asking the jinn or shaitan to come and help and do the job for them. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to confirm from him. He told him, "How do you know that this is this is a cure? How do you know that Fatiha walks in this way?" He says, "Oma idrika anna haruqiya." And did you do anything else? He said, "No, ya Rasulullah. I lam akra illa bi Fatiha al-Kitab. I did not read anything except Fatiha al-Kitab." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "He said, How do you know that Fatiha is ruqya?" And then he says, uh, "He said, thumma qala." He said, you did the right thing. What you did was right. He says, أُقْسِمُ لِي وَضْرِبُ لِي مَعْكُمْ سَهْمَا And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you were right. He said, now you can go and distribute it among yourself. And please, if, you, if you're doing that, do not forget me. Also, share with me some of the, some of the meat. <laughs> That's the best way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sometimes used to indicate that something is, is permissible. In that Sariya uh, to uh, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah, you know, when they were uh, uh, on the way back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were extremely hungry, you know. And they have, they have tamarat, you know, uh, pieces of tamar left. So a person will be given a tamarat, you know, one or two, three tamar for the whole day, you know. What can he do with that? So yamtasuha masan, you know the way you, you chew the, the sweet? 
Uh, that's the way they, they put tamr, you know, you have to keep on chewing it slowly, slowly, because that was the only tamr you have <laughs> throughout the day. You just take a bit to remove the hunger, and then later on also for the lunch, take some. You know, one piece of tamr, you have to deal with it like that, because it is going to finish, and you, do, you need to eat to survive. You know? Allah, those are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi They face a lot of difficulties in order for the future generation to get a very peaceful religion, and we did get but unfortunately, you still have some people who don't recognize their favor at all. May Allah guide them and their cool. So what happened is they were thinking of what to do. They don't know what to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought out uh, for them hut, a whale. It's called hut al-ambar. You know, uh, hut al-ambar, this is the name. And you have a blue whale and they have hut al-ambar. I forgot the name. And, uh, hmm? is, it, is that the one? It's from well? I don't know. But if you're sure, then we go with that. But check, inshallah, in the Google, uh, what, what is Hut al-Ambar? These are the kind of knowledge you can get it <laughs> from Sheikh Google, inshallah. Hut al-Ambar is a kind of a whale. It's so big, you know, Allah subhanahu wa throw it out of the sea. And it's so big in a way, uh, when they remove the eyes, you know, three people, you know, three people, in some place, 13, you know. But even one person can sit inside, you know, this is too big, you know. Three people can sit inside the hole of the eyes. SubhanAllah. You can imagine this is not a big whale. You know. so Allah SWT brought it out for them. And they remove one of his ribs and they fix it on the ground. They bring one of, the, uh, one of them who is the tallest person among them. He ride on the, the horse and he passed through the, the rib. You know. So they kept on eating, you know, for days, you know until they reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when they reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they told him Ya Rasulullah this is what happened we hope we did not do something wrong because we ate it the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Wa hal ma'akum hal baqiya ma'akum minhu shay the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said do you still have some part of the, the meat? he said yes Ya Rasulullah he said can I have some? SubhanAllah that's the, the, the peak of saying to uh, somebody that what he does is, is okay because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants the share from, from that one also. So from this hadith of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, you can see that he was reciting Surah Al-Fatiha and what happened to that person? The person was cured instantly. But as I said, this is only applicable upon, I mean, somebody who believes in it. If you don't believe in these things to be medicine, you know, to be the best cure that Allah SWT ever gave the humanity, they will never have impact on you. You know, the same goes to when you go to somebody to do ruqya on you. If you don't believe in what he does, it will not have any effect on you. You know, believe has to be there. And this is what Ibn Qayyim is going to talk about. That medicine has to be positioned on a fertile place, the place that is appropriate for it. Because there are places that doesn't suit that medicine. If you put the medicine in that place, it will be harming the place, you know. It will be harming the place. So the place has have to be suitable for it. You know, The place must be suitable for the medicine to be effective. قَالَ فَقَدْ أَثَّرَ هَذَا الدَّوَاءُ فِي هَذَا الدَّاءِ وَأَزَالَهُ حَتَّى كَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ He said, look at how this medicine is very effective. And it removed the, med uh, the disease in a way, it disappeared completely as if the man has never been troubled at all throughout his life. Subhanallah. How much you need to pay you know, for somebody to get Surah Al-Fatiha? You already memorize it. And if somebody is to ask you about Surah Al-Fatiha, when do you memorize it? Do you know when do you memorize? When do you memorize Surah Al-Fatiha? Do you remember the exact day you memorize Surah Al-Fatiha? It's, <laughs> it's hardly to find a Muslim, Muslim Muslim who is a born Muslim, you know, that can tell you the day he memorized Surah Al-Fatiha. Yes, uh, new Muslim, somebody who comes to Islam very new, yes, they, because they already matured, they know. Why is that? Because Surah Al-Fatiha from childhood, you know, from childhood people memorize Surah Al-Fatiha, from childhood. You know. So that's why he said, وَهُوَ أَسْحَلُ الدَّوَاءٍ وَأَيْسَرُهُ one of the most easiest there were any medicines in terms of achievement. You don't need to go to anywhere. In the place, same place where you are sitting, you can just take this medicine. It's Surah Al-Fatiha. You don't need to pay anything for that. 
if there is any payment, it's nothing but your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you believe in that medicine to be to be effective. قَالَ وَلَوْ أَحْسَنَ الْعَبْدُ التَّدَاوِي بِالْفَاتِحَةِ لَا رَأَى مِنْهَا تَأْثِيرًا عَجِيبًا فِي الشِّفَاءِ Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim says, if a person is going to use Surah Al-Fatiha in the best way, you know, as a medicine, he said, definitely you're going to see amazing things in your life concerning this Surah. Yeah, so as I said, Wallahi, all of these things are based on some, something, are uh, based on somebody who believes in them. If you don't believe in it, you will never see it. Nowadays, even the physical medicine we have, we started putting doubt in it, you know. Somebody was telling that, us that uh, honey also is not a medicine, it might harm you when you take it, you know, subhanAllah. Black seed also, they start putting doubt in it, you know. All of these things that our predecessors used to use and the Prophet Allah so talk about them, a lot talk about them, but now we started putting doubt in them, you know. So either somebody is totally ignorant or somebody who doesn't want to have, uh, to see any favor for Islam, you know, for this issue, or somebody who is a medical doctor that doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or somebody who is paid by them, you know, to stop these things. Because if they, if they are still in existence, then people will reduce their, their approaches to the hospitals. And some people don't want that because the business will stop. You know. So the idea is not about helping people to stay away from diseases, but the idea is to keep, the idea is to keep them, you know, being attached to the hospital so that the business could be, could be continuous sometimes. We have to wake up and understand how to live a good life. You know? I like the statement of somebody when he says, we're just trying to let you understand that your medicine lies in your food. You know, and Wallahi sadaqa rajul. Your medicine lies in your food. The way you eat, the way you drink, and what type of medicine you're taking from the natural things that Allah wants to put surrounding you. Those were the medicine in the past, and they are also somehow the medicine nowadays. When I say somehow, I'm talking about the belief of the people, but they remain medicine until the day of judgment. Ibn Qayyim says, I live in Mecca one day. When I was in Mecca, I have health problem in Mecca. And he says, I tried to find a, a tabib, you know, a, a doctor. I couldn't find anyone to help. He says, and I couldn't find any physical medicine. He said, what did I use after that, uh, apart from that? And instead of that, he said, I use uh, Surat al-Fatiha. He said, I have been using Surat al-Fatiha, and I see a lot of effects on it, you know, very amazing effects, you know. And I used to tell people who approach me at that moment, when they have any... Uh, disease and they couldn't find a medical doctor, I tell them, do this, go and use Surat Al-Fatiha. And most of these people, they got an instant cure, instant remedy to their, to their problems. So this is a very amazing surah, a very amazing surah, very amazing surah. But as I said, it only works on somebody, you know, with somebody who believes in it. قَالَ وَلَكِنَّ هَا هُنَا أَمْرٌ يَنْبَغِ أَتَّفَطُّنُ لَهُ وهو أن الأذكار والآيات والأدعية التي يستشفى بها ويلقى بها هي في نفسها نافعة هي في نفسها نافعة شافية ولكن تستدعي قبول المحل وقوة همة الفاعل. It's a very important any issue he's mentioning here. He said we have to know, you know, we have to take note here. There is some important note to be taken here. He says الأذكار, the ذكر that you're doing, you know. We know the car, and the ayat that you are reciting for protection, you know, well, adiya and the dua that you are making to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, all of these the car and the ayat and the dua that you are making, looking for the shifa, for the cure from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He says, "Hiya nafsiha adiya nafiya." You know, these ayat and these adhkar, you know, and these adiya, the dua that you are doing, they are beneficial in themselves. You know, they themselves they benefit. You know, if you look at them, they have a lot of things which a person can, can benefit from. So they themselves, they're beneficial to the life of humankind. But you should always take note that the benefits from these ayat and these adhkar and these adhiyah can only be achieved if two conditions have been made. 
نمبر 1 هي سيز قبول المحل ذا بليس هاف تو بي سويتبل فور ات فيرست ذا بليس هاف تو بي سويتبل فور ات لايك وين يو ميك دعاء ات نايت اند يو اسك الله سبحانه وتعالى تو بروتكت يو فروم شيطان يو ان يو هاوس يو نو سو يو اسكين الله يو ريد ان اي تو كرسي يو نو يو دونت وونت شيطان تو كم تو يور هاوس بت يو هاف انسايد يور هاوس اول كاينز اوف انفيتيشن فور ذا شيطان and all kinds of things which are chasing angels from coming inside the place you know so that's why the dua will not be effective you know so the place is not suitable to be protected that's why he says the dua you're making and the dhikr you're making and the ayat you're reciting they must you know be placed on a place which is suitable for them if the place is not suitable it doesn't work one of our scholars says shaitan doesn't chase away shaitan so if you yourself also you're not you know okay with it and you are not ready to accommodate that remedy it might not work in you no matter how much you try it might not be beneficial at all wa quwwatu himmat al fa'il wa ta'thiruhu the one who is making the dua he has to be conscious you know he has to be conscious we will address this consciousness inshallah because if you don't even know what you're talking about you're making dhikr but you don't know what you take what you're talking about it doesn't work it doesn't work So you have to be you know okay the body has to be ready for it and also you have to know exactly what you you do your qasd you know your intention your consciousness must be there when you approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for for this looking for this benefit qala fa mata takhallaf al shifa'u kana li dha'fi ta'thir al fa'il aw li adami qabul al mahall al munfasi al munfa'il is is whenever you see you doing this dua asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this ayat through this adiya but unfortunately the shifa is not coming that means one of these two conditions is not there either the place is not suitable or you are not serious in what you're doing aw imma limanin qawiyan fihi yamna an yanja fihi dawa there has to be something you know something that stop the dua being effective But when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using the dhikr using the dua or using the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking for protection the protection is guaranteed as long as you qualified you know you qualified that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you so don't worry all of these qualifications he's going to talk about them in detail what kind of attitude should a dai have when he approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what kind of behavior you should have for you to maintain you know that acceptance for you to get the acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qala kama yakunu dhalika fi al-adwiyati wal-adwa'i al-hissiyya he said this is also the same thing that is applicable when it comes to the physical medicine and the physical diseases when you take the medicine it has to meet a place that is suitable for it if it meets a place which is not suitable for it it kills you know you know that's why sometimes some of the medicine if they are given to you in the wrong place instead of giving you a medicine it kills you know so the the place have to be suitable for it he said this thing that we are saying which take place also in the spiritual uh, approaches it is the same thing also that take place in the physical physical approach qala fa inna adama ta'thirha qad yakun li adam qabul at-tabi'ati li dhalik ad-dawa he said sometimes the medicine you are taking the physical medicine you know the one that is tangible the one that you you hold in, in your hand he says sometimes they might not be effective because the nature of that place doesn't match the medicine at all the nature of the place doesn't match the medicine you know so what does that mean it means you should look for other alternatives so it doesn't mean the medicine is not good the medicine is not effective you know but the place doesn't suit, suit that medicine قال وقد يكون لمانع قوي يمنع من اقتضائه اثره فان الطبيعه اذا اخذت الدواء بقبول تام كان انتفاع كان انتفاع البدن به بحسب ذلك القبول وكذلك القلب اذا اخذ الرقى والتعويذ بقبول تام كان للراقي نفس فعاله وهمه مؤثره وكان للراقي نفس فعاله وهمه مؤثره اثر في ازاله الدواء he said this what i'm saying is Uh, when you take a medicine the physical medicine you know any medicine you take when you are sick you know it has to meet a place that is suitable for it you know and one of the most common example that comes to my mind is 
when, when you are about to go for surgery, they will never do it until the body can accept it, you know. They have to go for test, to test the suitability of the body first. Otherwise, instead of looking for medicine, they, it will end by a tragedy. He said the same goes to the heart. The heart also is like that. If the heart is sincere and see this in what the dai is talking about, you know, and is also uh, uh, accepted that medicine, kabul a term, you know. That's why I said it, it is a matter of belief. You agree that yes, this is a remedy that Allah SWT has sent to humankind. And if you, you believe that when you use it, you will get the cure. Bi idhn Allah Ta'ala, Allah SWT will grant you the remedy. Bi idhn Allah Ta'ala. Qala wa kathalika dawa'u fa innahu min aqwa al-asbabi fi dhikri wa kathalika dua'u fa innahu min aqwa al-asbabi fi dafi al-makruh wa usul al-matlub. He said the same goes to the dua. A dua, a dua that you are making, you know, invocation, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said this is one of the strongest causes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in us, which helps a person to remove that which he, he doesn't desire. You know, when you have something which is disliked by you, you have some problem, you have sickness, one of the greatest remedy that you have, one of the strongest, you know, one of the quickest remedy that you have for this is the dua, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very simple to be understood because the one who created everyone, the disease and the cure, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he knows what you're, what you're suffering from. You know, the medical doc the doctors, it might take them in years, ages, trying to diagnose the problem, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows what, what is going on with you. So for sure, if you were to ask him to take care of that enemy of yours, that would be the quickest medicine a person should be looking for. But as I said, this is all based on belief. If a person believes in it, then it will work, inshallah. وَلَكِنْ قَدْ يَتَخَلَّفُ عَنْهُ أَثَرُهُ إِمَّا لِضَعْفٍ فِي نَفْسِهِ بِأَنْ يَكُونَ دُعَاءً لَا يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ لِمَا فِيهِ مِنَ الْعُدْوَانِ But sometimes you might make dua, but there is no effect. It doesn't take any effect. Why is that? Because the dua itself is weak. Is weak enough to be effective. You know, cannot be effective at all. Why is it weak? Maybe you are making the dua in a wrong way. You're asking Allah SWT something which you shouldn't ask. You know, you're asking Allah SWT to help you to disconnect yourself from your relatives. You're asking Allah SWT to grant you ability to go and do something which you know it is sin. You know. So Allah SWT will not grant you this. You know. This is the mujawazat al if dua, going beyond the limit when you're making dua. So this, this dua is weak in itself. And as such, Allah SWT will never accept it. وَإِمَّا لِضَعْفِ الْقَلْبِ وَعَدَمِ إِقْبَالِهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَجَمْعِهِ عَلَيْهِ وَقْتَ الدُّعَى Or oh, sometimes the dua will not be accepted by Allah SWT because when you are making the dua, you are not focused at all. You are asking Allah SWT but you don't know what you are talking about. And you are asking Allah SWT but at the same time you don't know, I mean you are not conscious, you know. You don't know what you are asking. Not just about you don't know the meaning but you don't even know what you are asking about. And subhanAllah, هذا منطبق على هؤلاء الناس. You know, when you go for uh, Umrah in Mecca, you know, for those of you who participated in Umrah, you know, you know, uh, I'm telling you the truth that you, uh, most likely you met a group of people who are uh, led by somebody, you know. And this person is making dua and the rest are saying Ameen. You know, the rest are saying Ameen. SubhanAllah, a great waste of time. You know, because many of these people, they don't even know what that dua is all about. Because sometimes they don't speak Arabic and he's reading the dua in Arabic. You know, if he let them go and make the dua in their own language, it could be beneficial for them because this Umrah is for you. you know, umrah is for you. Every single part of the Umrah and Hajj is involved in the dua for yourself. That's why the best, if you don't speak Arabic, do not go for it. Just use your own language so that you can express yourself and tell Allah SWT exactly what you're looking for. Not asking somebody to read and you don't even know what he's talking about. He's just saying, I mean, for what? And sometimes they even make a joke. You know, I don't know what is correct or wrong, but one of our friends said, he heard or somebody heard, a person was reading the dua, you know, Allahumma, Allahumma, salli, salli. You know, at the end of the dua, you know, they have to read the whole book, you know. You know, books, they are, they are published by, by publishers, you know. So this man doesn't know Arabic, you know. He is also reading the dua just like that. So he finished all the dua and he went on reading even the, the publisher's address and printed, printed, in, in, but in Arabic. Tobia, Tobia, fi, fi, matba'ati, matba'ati al Bashir. And the people are saying, Ameen, Ameen, you know. SubhanAllah, so silly. The people who are there who speak Arabic, they will be laughing at them, you know. 
And they're the cause, you know. They're the cause. This happens always, you know. No, Allah SWT did not ask you to do that. Use the language you can understand. Shaykh al Islam bin Tamir once said, he said, if you don't speak the standard Arabic language, use the language that the people in your place are speaking. Allah knows what you're talking about, you know. You're making dua, use the same language, the same accent that the people are speaking. Because if you go to speak, you know, when or to speak uh, the standard Arabic language, you might make a lot of mistakes. Why do you go for those mistakes, you know? You go, instead of asking something, you ask, uh, you, you, you ask Allah not to give you that, you know. So use the amir you have, you know, the accent you're having. If you don't speak Arabic language and you are making Umrah or Hajj, just speak your language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all languages and He knows what you're talking about. You know? So in dua, you need to focus. If you, when you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept your dua, you really need to be focused. Like, uh, move behind, move behind. You really need to be, to be focused. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept according to some of the hadith attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept the dua from the heart that is heedless, you know, heedless, unconscious, you know, that is away from that dua that a person is, is making. So he says sometimes you make dua and the dua will not be accepted because the dua in, in itself is weak. You know, you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something which you know you shouldn't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Or sometimes the heart is not attentive. The heart is not listening to what you're talking about. The heart doesn't know what you're doing. And then the dua will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ وَإِمَّا لِضَعْفِ الْقَلْبِ وَعَدَنِ إِقْبَالِهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَجَمْعِهِ عَلَيْهِ وَقْتَ الدُّعَى فَيَكُونُ بِمَنْزِلَةِ الْقَوْسِ الرُّخِ جِدًا Zainab, move, you're disturbing me. So this dua is going to be like what? Like the qawse. The qawse is the bow. You have the... The arrow, you know, that's the, the arrow you shoot. You put it on the on the bow, I guess. Yeah, go. The name is bow, right? The thing, and you put the arrow. Okay. The cause is like the bow. This bow has to be strong. Because if you put the arrow, you know, on the, the water, you know, and you stretch it, the bow has to be, uh, I mean, resisting, you know. Stay in the way it is. If the bow is going to follow you, so the shooting is going to be very weak. So he said, this dua is going to be like that. You have the bow which is so weak. When you stretch the, 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 the water, it is going to follow you also. So when you shoot, the shooting is not going to be strong enough. That's exactly when the dua is weak. Or you have some other weaknesses that are making the dua weak. In a way, Allah SWT will not listen to that dua. قَالَ فَإِنَّ السَّهَمَ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ خُرُوجًا ضَعِيفًا or sometimes the dua will not be accepted because you have an external factor that stops that dua from being accepted. Like what? Like eating haram. When you eat haram, most likely your dua is not going to be heard. Like zul, when you're oppressor, you're oppressing others, whoever this person might be. You know, not just when you're a leader, no, even your family in the house, because you're also a leader in the house. You oppress your family, you oppress your wife, you oppress your children, you oppress your husband, you oppress whoever you're oppressing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might not listen to your dua whenever you make dua. And when they make dua against you, it is going to reach you for sure. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, And sometimes the heart will be having the rain. Rain is like a paint. When a person commits sin, when a person commits sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put a black dot on his heart. The more sin the person commits, the more darkness exists in the heart. So slowly, slowly, until the time it covers all the heart, you know, a'udhu billah, until the time it, it covers all of the heart. So when a person has this rain in the heart, this disease inside the heart, his dua might not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Allah salamu alayhi wa sila in ghaflati wa shahwati wa lahwi wa ghalabati hali. And sometimes... The reason why the dua is not going to be accepted because this place, this person is very playful. His life is all about play, you know, and uh, it's extremely heedless. You know, if you're looking for heedlessness, you get this person. This person is extremely in a state of sleep all the time. So most likely, when he makes dua, he's going to make the dua also in that situation, and as such, his dua might not be accepted by by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. قال كما جاء كما في مستدرك مستدرك الحاكم من حديث أبي هريرة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أدعو الله وأنتم موقنون بالإجابة وعلموا أن الله لا يقبل دعاء من قلب غافل. 
So there's a very interesting hadith to support all of these uh, that we have been, uh, mentioned and also other hadith mentioned by uh, Ibn al-Qayyim to support uh, uh, what we have mentioned about the conditions and the reason why some dua are not seen to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this will be tackled bi idn Allah ta'ala in the, in the next uh, class inshallah. So the next class will be on this and also and, uh, the issue of the dua, how to make dua and uh, what are the conditions of the dua and how to make your dua effective, you know, what are the adab that a person should be observing when he is making dua bi idn Allah ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. So I will stop here inshallah for question and answers if uh, any one of you ha uh, ha have question. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you good. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shara la ilaha illa anta astaghfir ka atubu ilayk. Yes, Abdurrahman. Assalamu alaikum. Abdurrahman, are you still Not so sure, let me check. Okay. Allah is Kullahu namu wa la tastaqidu ma faza illa nuwamu. And Khalid, if you, can, if you have the questions, so just read them for us, inshallah. Okay, Abdurrahman. <laughs> okay. Uh, come again, Abdurrahman. What makes Arabic superior to all other languages? Uh, it is the language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, decreed that he will choose it, you know, for uh, the best, the best gift he has given humankind, and that's the Quran. There is no book that is similar to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Quran. All the previous books, they are in terms of ranking, lower than the position of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمُحَيْمِنَ Ali." In those books, Quran superseded them. It has whatever they, you can find in them and also other matters also. It's a very comprehensive book which has no deficiency in it at all. They're all, they're all kalam Allah azza wa jalla, but Quran in terms of comprehensiveness, Quran is better than any other Quran, uh, any other book. So to have a language cho being chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this book to be revealed, that itself is enough to show an importance and also comprehensiveness, and this is true. I don't know on earth a language that is so rich than the Arabic language. I don't know on earth a language, I don't, I don't say there isn't, but I have never come across somebody who says there is a language and he, is, he can prove it. A language that is richer than the Arabic language. It's so rich in, term, in terms of its nature. You know, uh, almost every single thing has the way for you to address it, you know. So uh, that that's makes Arabic language superior on uh, other languages is enough, as I said, to, to have this language being chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reveal his final book in it, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala united everyone. And you can say also, and some people said, this is the best language that you can unite all of the humanity on. The best language that you can unite everyone upon it. So that's, that's the Arabic, Arabic language. So these are a few that could be said concerning this, uh, this matter, but for sure, Arabic language is taking superior, uh, superiority over the rest of the, of the languages. So we're talking about language, but we're not talking about people. People, in akramakum in dallahi atqaqum, the best in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who uh, is better in terms of taqwa. And uh, this knowledge is given to whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wish. If you look at the those people who carry the knowledge of Islam, most of them are non-Arab. Most of them are non-Arab. You know. uh, look at those uh, Kutub al-Sitta you know, that we have. You know, if you check the biography of almost all of them, none of them is from the Arabs. And subhanAllah, 
These are the people who carry the deed. They have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot from the Arabs. But if you look at the vast majority of those people who excel in the knowledge, they're not from the Arabs. Because the religion is not only for the Arabs, it's for everyone. Allah just put this language because it's the easiest language that you can unite everyone and it's the best language that you can use to support, uh, I mean, to support an understanding of the religion. That's why the best way to understand Islam is Arabic language. You know, the best way to understand Islam is to learn and to master the Arabic, the Arabic language. You look at the Quran. You know, Shatabi says, Abu Amrihim waliyah subiyyu ibn Amirin sarihun wa baqihim ahata bihil wala. You know, he talks about the Qur'an of Sab'a, Shatabi. He says it's only Abu Amr and also Ibn Amr. These are the only ones that are purely Arabs. The rest, they are all the children of slaves. But look at how Allah SWT elevated them in ranking. They are those people who spread the knowledge of Allah SWT in the world. So what I'm trying to say is when it comes to the language, yes, the language is more superior than any other language. If you look at the nature and the choice of Allah SWT, for this is more than enough. You know, and also the nature of the language itself. And uh, also secondly, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this is only for the language. But if you're talking about uh, superiority in terms of personality, who is the best? Is it Arabi or uh, what do you call a non-Arab or this or that? This one is uh, a matter that uh, is concluded in Islam that nobody is better than other person except in terms of taqwa. You are better than somebody, then uh, that means your taqwa is better than his. In akramakum in the atqakum. The best among you is the one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, regardless of his affiliation. Your uh, your race, your language, your color, your nature will never benefit you in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. The only thing that benefits you is is the taqwa. So I guess I uh, I addressed your question, Amina. Barakallahu fiqum. Question message. Mm. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Which do you use Surah Al Fatiha as Do we recite only once? No, he said he kept on reciting. He kept reading, reading, reading. You read as much as you want. Some scholars said seven times. The best is to use seven times. They have their own justification and their own approaches, but in this hadith, uh, it is mentioned that he kept on reading. So he can read also a lot of time, a lot of time. He did now read later every single time until the time he get the cure. Might be at the same time, you know, it depends on the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then your belief. And it might be afterwards, after a few days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the shifa. But the shifa will come, be ta'ala, inshaAllah. Yes. Uh, question message, question for Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Is it okay for anyone to recite certain verses with a strong belief that it would cure certain diseases, for example, cancer, even though there is no evidence in the ahadith? Because someone told us to recite the first five verses of Surah Al Qalam by putting the hand on the case of the illness. Uh, with the meaning of the verses, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't match with the condition. Mm. However, we discovered uh, in many certain words made more sense than coincidentally. Is it acceptable, Asia? The best, uh, Sister Nurita, the best is to read what came from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like Fatiha, like Mu'awwidatain, uh, like Qulhu Allahu Ahad. These are the things we got from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and to go for the du'a he made, you know. These are the best thing we should do, to go for the dua he made. You know, the person who is suffering from cancer, put his hand on the place, you know, and then say to, say, say, make the dua. You know, uh, uh, Say Bismillah, Bismillah, Bismillah three times. You know, do that uh, dua which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to mention. Or somebody can do the dua for him. You know, put his hand on the place where the injury is or the, the thing is, and then Bismillah Aqiq, in kulli shayin yuzik, or min shaddi kulli aini hasirin, Allahu yashfiq. Or put your hand on the place and say, Adhi bil ba'sa rabban nas, washfi anta shafi, la shifa illa shifa uk, shifa la yungadur saqama. These are the ad'iya the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do. This is where barakah lies. Wallahi, sometimes asking, 
you know, people you don't even know who you go to. You know, sometimes you see the way they ask you to recite in the Quran, you also will have a doubt in that in that thing, you know. So we it's the best is to restrict ourselves to what came from the Prophet وسلم, or what was approved by Rasulullah. Fatiha is one of the most effective ones. Every disease, any disease that a person is suffering from, if you can do this bi idnillahi ta'ala, insha'Allah, insha'Allah, the cure will come, insha'Allah. Yes, Abdul Rahman. Uh, yeah, if a person is not making it for business, this is an issue where the scholars argue, can a person take uh, money for the ruqya? Can a person take money when he reads Quran, you know, teaches people Quran? Can he take money or not? You know? So based on this hadith, yes. And uh, the only thing is, if there is nobody to do it except you, if there is nobody to do it except you, and they couldn't find any option except you, and they don't have money to pay, then you have to do it for free. You have to do it for free. But other than that, it's okay when you do the ruqya and people give you money for that, it's okay, 100% okay. Because the Prophet ﷺ ate it, you know, when they gave it to him, he ate it also. May Allah guide us to the truth. Yeah, uh, uh, definite, definitely both of them. That's why they said Qabul al Mahal. Kabul Mahal means the place where you are making the ruqya have to be suitable for the ruqya itself. You get it? That's why one of our scholars, as I said, said, it says it's wrong to go to anyone to do ruqya for you because if that person is shaitan, you should know that shaitan doesn't chase away shaitan. It makes the other shaitan stronger. And if a person also is shaitan himself, the ruqya of the raqi will not work. You know, a person doesn't, does, doesn't obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does all of the tragedies, no wearing hijab, doing haram, and all of these things that a person is doing, you know, male or female. And then you are invited to come and make dua for him. So you maintain your righteousness, but he's not. So you will be making the dua for him, but at the same time, the dua is not going to be effective because the place is not suitable for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the truth. So people say an untidy room chases the angels away. Is this true? Uh, what chases the angels away? An untidy room. A room that is not clean. Uh, no, no, no. I've never, I never come across this. I never heard of it except now. Pictures, having pictures in the room, yes. Angels will never come to that room. And uh, if the, those angels are not in the room, then shaitan will replace them. That's why they refuse even to go inside the house of the Prophet ﷺ. For sure, if we have pictures in our, in our rooms, also angels will not come to that house. But your house is not clean. Angel will not come to that house. I never heard of it. I never come across a place where it is mentioned that angels, uh, you have to clean your house for them to come. Ashbahu bil khurafa. And it's similar to khurafa. You know, storytelling. You know. mm. Because you have you have you have a person who is Ash'at Aghbar, you know. Ash'at Aghbar, you know. The Prophet Sallallahu described him, he has a lot of dust in him. You know. He himself, not even his house, he himself, you know. And he's so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way if he swears by Allah that something is going to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not embarrass him. Allah will do the thing for him. So that, uh, to my knowledge, there is no such thing. Well, pictures, when you have them in the house, yes. Even if the house is cleaner than whatever. Mm. Yes, Abdul Rahman. No, it's okay, inshallah, because you need them from time to time. Instead of going all the time doing, uh, it's okay, you have them. 
Uh, the best is to remove all of these things because sometimes you might forget to, and leave them open in the house. The best is just leave them uh, as a soft copy. You know, whenever you need them, you go and uh, reprint them again. But you can, but you can keep. You can print more than what you need and keep them because the need keep arising. Let's say they issue a passport. You know, every few years the passport finish, then you have to go and do it again. So uh, that's your life. And keep them, inshallah, as long as you preserve them. Uh, but don't keep them in a place where you, where, you, where you stay. Hide them always. Yeah, I think we answered this question. Yes, uh, you do. Uh, right after he, he finished, uh, I'm sorry, the Mu'addin finished the Adhan. And you make dua, of the Salah for the Prophet Sallallahu and that dua, you know, if there is time, you make dua. And that's it. And some said you make dua between the two, two, two sittings of the Imam. Uh, make dua between the two sittings of the Imam. But I have never come across a place where it is mentioned that the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to raise up their hands and make, uh, make dua in that, in that position. And as such, I will advise a person to just pay attention and listen to the khutbah attentively. While, once the imam started, you just listen. You know, before he starts, you can make whatever you want. But once he started the khutbah, just remain silent until then. If you want the best time for, uh, for, for dua on Friday, is the last moment of the Friday, the day, you know, a few minutes before sunset. It's a very important time. I've seen how people are rushing to this uh, moment in Medina, in the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu On Friday, you will see those old people, you know. It's like in every country, the old people, they are the only ones lo who are looking for reward, you know. See them in the Masjid. Uh, that moment, they don't waste it. You know. May Allah grant us good. Yeah, those ones that I have mentioned when I answered a question from uh, Aznarita, may Allah preserve all of you. Uh, those one, uh, the best dua is to do the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asking Allah SWT to grant you health. These are the best dua, the most effective one. And yakfiha anha min al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's enough that these are from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I advise this book, uh, this book, Hisn uh, al-Muslim, uh, you know, Mention a lot of uh, at the ear concerning this matter. You know, this is the best thing to to revise Abu Bakr. You know, whatever is attributed to the Prophet ﷺ, which he used to do, you know, mention when he is asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for health. This is the best thing you should do. Mm. Yes, of that one. Uh, no, it's, it's, it, you shouldn't do that, you know. That might lead to uh, deviation or innovation, you know. You have some people who sell this also. They recite Quran in the water and they sell it, you know. You have water nowadays which has been sold and people will tell you the Quran has been recited in it. This is not the attitude of the predecessors. But there are some who said if you have the Quran and you read the Quran, read in the Quran, you read it in the water and drink it, there are some great scholars who said that, that would be okay. And it is really effective, especially for somebody who is affected by magic. You know. Read the fatha and blow inside. Read and blow inside and then drink the water. It will to be effective. But reading and then saving for later, I never heard of this. But as, as I said also, it might lead to uh, something wrong in, in the future. Actually, it's not blowing. 
it's a kind of spitting, you know, spit, and then of course the air comes inside. It's kind of a spitting you're doing. Uh, so, so, so in this case, be the Allah Taala, you know, inshallah, inshallah. I don't have anything specific from the Prophet Sallallahu that advised a person to do that. I'm just saying you there are some scholars who said it is okay and it has been tested and it has it was effective in this in this way. So inshallah if a person is satisfied and do it, it's not blowing, you know, putting a blowing air, it's kind of spitting, you know. Of course then some air comes out, but it is not that one that you're talking about. May Allah grant us good. If you, if you, whatever you have confusion, uh, Shafa, this is it's a Shafa, right? Whatever confusion you have, just go to something that you, you're not confused. You know. Check into other method used by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just do that one. You will get what you're looking for. Be even light Ta'ala. Stay away from anything that you're confused. You know, just go and, uh, go and check from that which was done by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do it. You will get what you're looking for. Be even la. Yeah, <laughs> you see, you see the Arabic language. You know, just study nahu and the sarf. You know, the constructions of the word, the root of the word, is taken from this. You know, having having a word that some scholars of the the language would tell you that this 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 thing, this animal, or this thing has one thousand names, six thousand names, two hundred names. You know. And they will be able to prove it according to language itself. You know, it's not easy to find a language like this. Almost everything has its own way to be to be addressed. But you have the, the af'al. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. So when you when you have the the the, the and the, what do you call when you have the, the nahu, you know, look at the af'al, the way the fi'l is constructed, going to the mavi. Al-Mudari, al mustaqbal you know, and you have this this uh, names also division of the name the names and the masadir, you know, and the pronouns and jama' uh, al-Muthanna, you know, and and the letters, you know, in almost every letter you have, although there are some letters also we have in other language which you don't find them in Arabic uh, language, but in there also in Arabic language you have letters also which you couldn't find in in some other languages. And uh, uh, what else to be to be to be mentioned? So if you look at the 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 the, the, the grammar itself, you know, and the knowledge which we call sarf, and the knowledge which we call fasaha and balaga, and the, the adab and all of those disciplines that are connected to the Arabic language, you will understand that yes, and it's a language that just to change, you know, haraka, you know, in it, it might change the entire meaning, you know. Which the change might be like the heavens and the earth, you know. You might find some of these things that I have ma uh, uh, mentioned in, in, uh, being applicable in other languages, but to find uh, all of these things that I have uh, mentioned, uh, Amina, being found in a single language, I have never come across somebody who claimed this to be in existence in any other language. So that's the reason why uh, it is mentioned that Arabic language is the richest language you can find on earth. In, term, in terms of what you call it nature, you know, in terms of it nature. Uh, it's so rich, so rich, you know. As I said, the simple uh, mistake, you know, of the harakat that you will make, it will change the entire meaning, you know. If I say malak, I said malik, you know, I said malak and malik, you know, al malik is a king, al malak, you know. <clears throat> Just the harakat I change. One of them is angel and the other one is a king, you know. And the one is insan, the other one is. Malaika. So, so, so these are some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to, uh, what do you call, uh, explain to you when I said Arabic language is the richest language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever gave humanity. I have never come across, as I said, a language that can claim this. It might have some details, but honestly speaking, in all the languages that I come across, I have never come across a language 
that can claim this, unless if it is a language that is also closer to the Arabic language, because we do have languages which are closer to the Arabic language in terms of nature, in terms of even the way they write, you know, they might be having these things in them. Yeah? They might be having these things in them. So, Wallahu A'lam. Yes, Abdurrahman. Uh, no, they will get the reward of seeking knowledge. Yeah, it is not going to be free. No, they will be given the reward of seeking uh, the knowledge. But they will not be given the reward of reading the Quran because they are not reading the Quran. But they will be given the reward of learning. <coughs> How much is that reward? Allahu A'lam. You know, it might be so great, you know, you don't know how much Allah SWT is going to give you and nobody can decide. Allah is the one who decides. It depends on the intention of the person and why is he reading the, the interpretation or the tafsir. May Allah grant us good. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Put, uh, put, in, put in what? No, I have never come across this. <laughs> it looks like Dajjal. No. And, and, uh, this, is, this is wrong uh, practice. You know, Never come across any of our mashayikh or from the Salaf al Salih that mentioned this to be uh, to be done, you know, for a person who who is uh, feeling sick. So I said the best is to restrict ourselves to that which is uh, given to us by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is where we find the shifa in this life. We hear a lot of things, uh, Sister Murni, a lot of things. And that's the reason why we should be very careful and very selective, also very sensitive when it comes to whom to be asked, especially in these in these matters. Yes, Abdurrahman. I mean, where well, you Sometimes we have a wish for what we want that might only benefit us, but not be favorable to others. So we bury the wish in our heart. Uh, but the most has I knows everything. Will Allah grant what is in our heart, or Allah only grants what we utter in our hearts? Uh, no, the only thing that you get, you know, good thoughts and good thinking, be is in Allah Ta'ala, it will be rewarded. If it is good, if it is good, you have a good thing, you know, good intention to do something, but you are not able to do it, you will be rewarded for that. Uh, and, and, uh, but when it comes to sins, you know, only when you do it, or when you attempt to do it, you know, but usually when you do an action, then a last matter will reward you for that. That Allah, out of His infinite mercy, even if you think of doing something good, but you are not able to do it, you will be rewarded according to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yes, sir. Wa alaikum salam. You try when you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go to the place in that house where there is no pictures and images. Scholars said usually the place that is affected is the place where those pictures exist. And you have a house which has different places, inshallah, angels will come into the place where the picture doesn't exist. And you have no problem, be it in light Allah, for your dua to be carried up by the angels when you make it, inshallah. That's why I try, the company is always good. You know. Uh, get people to be, especially when it comes to the roommate, classmate, uh, uh, housemate, you know, get somebody who fits you. you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good. Yeah, it comes because it's learning Arabic language is part of the deen. If a person is having good intention in it, it's part of the deen. As I said, to, to, to learn the deen correctly, you know, 
the best way to learn the deen correctly is to learn the Arabic language. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in Arabic language. All the hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ were given to us in Arabic language. None of them is given in any other language. And the scholars transfer them in Arabic language. For sure, if you're talking about Islamically, which language should be given preference, of course, is the Arabic language. Not because somebody is speaking it or somebody... No, because it, this is the language of the religion itself. You know, the language of the religion. We just have to believe in that. It's the language that Allah SWT chose to reveal the religion in it. As, as a Muslim, you know, a student of knowledge should try and learn the Arabic language. It's not wajib to learn the Arabic language, but it's a favor. You know, it's a favor. That's why even some scholars, they said a student of knowledge who speaks Arabic language, it is makruh for them to speak, Arab, to speak other than Arabic language. They don't say haram, it's not haram, but they say it's a dislike for the students of knowledge when they learn the Arabic language to speak other than Arabic language. You know. So as I said, just understand it from this dimension that this is the language that last Martin revealed the book with it. And this is the language, almost everything that is given to us, the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is in that language. Almost every act of worship, you do it in the language. The statements, the ad'iya that you do in the prayer, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught people in the Arabic language. They, do, they did have some other language in existence, but there was no mention by the Prophet Sallallahu for a person to use other than the Arabic language. May Allah grant us a uh, good. Uh, no, that's not correct. That's incorrect. That's incorrect. In, that, in terms of respect, then the, any, any writing, because you know, writing khat is respected. It's something that has kar, yani karama, respect. You shouldn't throw it away if you don't need to throw it away. But if you need to throw it away, as long as there is no names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it, there is no Quran, there is no hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when you throw it away, there is nothing in that. Be it ta'ala. Even if it is in Arabic language. He doesn't want me to inform others about him. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> I have a person who does it, and a very good person that I trust. I send a lot of people uh, to him, but uh, I, and he, sometimes he had to tell me that if not you, I will not accept. You know, so I don't want to keep pressuring person like this. But uh, but he's a very good person, and he's very good, you know, in his manhaj, in inshallah, in his aqidah, and uh, but he's good in that regard. Apart from him, I don't know anyone. Okay, so I, my advice is, even he himself, I don't take people to him unless if there is no any other option. I always advise people to do ruqya for themselves, by themselves. You know, this is the best. He also, when you meet him, this is what he will be focusing on. You curing, I mean, helping yourself by yourself, because this is the best ruqya. Because once you believe in that and you do it effectively, if the thing is gone, alhamdulillah, and most likely will never come out, come back again, inshallah. So ruqya should be done by the person himself. Unless if he cannot do it, then we look for, for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Has to do tayammum and pray. Has to do tayammum and pray. Get it? If, if the prayer is, uh, is not dhuhr or, or asr or maghrib and isha, because usually maghrib and uh, dhuhr and asr, just wait until the time you, draw, you reach the, 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 your destination, then you combine both prayers. You know. The same goes to maghrib and isha, asr and Wait until you reach your destination. As long as the time of the last one is not over yet, let's say you have the the dream in the dhuhr time, 
just delay it until the time you reach your destination before Maghrib, still the Asr time is there, then you combine Zuhur and Asr. The same goes to Maghrib and Isha also. But when it comes to Fajr, let's say if it is Fajr and if you don't do, the time will, will finish. Uh, in this case, you just make the mum and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot let, let the time finish because of this. Uh, this, uh, he's uh, uh, beating two birds with one stone. Uh, Ruqya and then his memorization. He is memorizing and then doing his Ruqya also. He is revising and Ruqya also. Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> In the ayat and the, the hadith which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recite in a day? Yeah, that's what she's referring to. Specifically. I, d I, don't th I don't think, uh, Sister Murni, this could be found. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read things when there is need for them. He read ayat in the, in the prayers. He did dua when uh, the time for that dua arrives. You know. So to find something specific which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is doing on the daily basis, uh, this one, to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. There are ayat which he read at night. Yes, the surahs which he read at night. Uh, this one also, you can find them in, in the Hisn al-Muslim. You can find them in Hisn al-Muslim. And other books of Ad'iyah, like Al-Adhkar al we find the authentic one. Well, Wabil al-Sayyib li Shaykh al-Islam bin Taymiyyah. And all of these authentic books that talks about the Ad'iyah, you find them mentioned in these things, inshallah. But to find a specific book that confine Com uh, compile uh, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do here and there, uh, I don't think it does exist in this way. But uh, my advice to you, Sister Murni, stick with those books. Hisn al-Muslim, the book of Adkar for the Nawawi, you know. And the, the one also Khalid is given here, Al-Amal al wal al yom al yom wal layla you know, Imam al-Nasai. Any book that is authentic, talking about uh, Adkar of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's very good to stick with that, inshallah. Question by Sister Shaba. Now we're going to confirm if we should totally avoid using water and oil for purposes of Rokia. Should we uh, per, uh, avoid using water and oil for Rokia? Who said? All of you just want to confirm is that the case? Uh, no, nobody says you should avoid them in terms of ruqya. And what kind of ruqya are you doing? You know, are you talking about using oil for ruqya? Which oil is that? Because ruqya means medicine, looking for medicine. You know, when you drink honey, it is part of ruqya. When you drink black seed, it's also ruqya. You know, so it's part of the ruqya. When you make dua, it's also ruqya. When you're asking Allah subhanahu wa taala shifa, when you're reciting Quran, it's also ruqya. So I don't get the question that much. Uh, maybe you can put it uh, again in the group or send it to me personally, inshallah. Uh, she means that uh, we said that blowing into the water or the oil and drinking it, like blowing in it after reading the Surah Al-Fatiha or the Surah al and then drinking it, that's okay, right? Yeah, that's, I don't want to call it blowing, you know, <laughs> although it's... It should be, could be translated, but it's not really blowing in. Inshallah, inshallah is okay, Sister Shafa. But as I said, these matters, they are said by some scholars. You know, a person can do that. I couldn't find it in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, that this is what he did, or somebody was, was done. I can't remember an incident like that. But uh, uh, if you're not satisfied, as I said, Sister Shafa, uh, Shafa stick with those which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do or his companion did and he approved it, you know, whatever you're looking for, you will get it in that. You know, black seed, uh, honey, you know, cupping and the ayat and the adhkar and the ad'iyah, 
done by the Prophet وسلم, whatever you're looking for, be it in Allah, you get it through that, inshallah. Yeah, when you talk about the Mus'haf, this is the Qur'an that is compiled. Okay, that's the Mus'haf. You might attach it to the, uh, to the uh, uh, I mean, other languages. There's Mus'haf and something in, in, inside it. That English text or any other language is not Qur'an at all. It's not Qur'an. You cannot say, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى In the name of Allah, the Beneficent. Allah did not say this. You have to say, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ You know? You cannot say call Allah Ta'ala and then read the translation. You can do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good. Yeah, that's that's more than. Yeah, that la yukallifu lifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha. You just hide it, put it in your pocket. Even in the pocket, you just leave it. Leave it in the bag, leave it in your wallet. You know, just don't bring it out openly. So as to allow the Insha Allah, this is whenever you are in a situation. This is the extent of your ability, and the action itself is legal for you to do it. You know, because these type of pictures, they have no problem in them, inshallah. So when the action is legal for a person to do it, be in the light, Allah, the restriction also will be taken, inshallah. But uh, the rule is to qaddaru bi qaddariha. Okay, I was actually almost going to tell you, Abdurrahman, we delay the rest of the question, but alhamdulillah. <laughs> Okay, barakallahu feekum jami'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in you and your life. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, help us to maintain our attitude, our iman, and increase our faith and belief in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as I always say, exercise patience, inshallah, and come to the class and try put that which you have learned into practice and action. Uh, this is the best way for you to give zakat to the knowledge and to preserve that which you are, which you are learning, inshallah. بارك الله فيكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته